Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And on our panel tonight, the Conservative MP, former Education Secretary Nicky Morgan, who was one of the 11 Tories who voted against the government last night. And Rebecca Long-Bailey, Labour's Shadow Secretary for Business. She's been an MP for two years and was an early supporter of Jeremy Corbyn as Labour leader. The scientist, broadcaster, expert on the joys and the pains of childhood, Professor Robert Winston. The former political editor of the Sunday Times and the Daily Mail, the fervent Brexiteer, Isabel Oakeshott, and that rarity on the stand-up circuit, a comedian who votes Conservative and voted Brexit and survived those audiences, so tonight should be a walk in the park for Jeff Norcott. Thank you very much. Now, of course, from home, you can, as always, argue the toss using hashtag BBCQT on Twitter, on Facebook, or you can text 83981, push the red button to see what others are saying. But there's something I should tell you if you tweet uh, about Question Time. You may not have seen this. It was reported this week that we are the second most tweeted programme in Britain on television. Hmm. And only Love Island <laughs> <laughs> gets more tweets than we do. So I'm applying to go on Love Island in the next series. <laughs> so our first question tonight, let's have that, from James Powers, please. James Powers. When will some MPs stop trying to subvert the will of the British people on Brexit? <laughs> uh, are you thinking of anybody around this table, James? <laughs> Nicky Morgan, you better start. I, say, I think that might be, uh, might be aimed at, uh, at me. And last night was not about uh, doing that. We've had the referendum. We had the vote in June 2016. Uh, and uh, people have made the decision to leave the European Union. The question now is how we leave the European nice Union. Job, and... <laughs> well, this is one of the issues, because the referendum has proved, I think, the most divisive thing I have ever come across in my political career. I've been involved in politics for almost 30 years. And it's, uh, it's something we have to have a proper uh, debate uh, about. Uh, and actually, if we're going to continue to revert to uh, labels, misrepresentations, threats, bullying, intimidation, then we are not going to do the best by the country, which is now about getting the best possible deal in the European what Union. What were you trying to achieve, then? <laughs> what, what? We know everybody, uh, the majority of people in this country voted Brexit. What's the idea of last night's vote except to change the deal the Prime Minister might get? What's no, the aim of it? The aim is to make sure that Parliament, the UK Parliament, like the EU Parliament, has a say, a meaningful say, on the final deal. But I thought the vote was given to us, the people, under the referendum. Well, the decision to leave... <laughs> Well, the decision to leave has been made. I mean, that's, that's, that's been and gone. So uh, those who uh, voted to, to leave, uh, many of them still don't seem to be able to, to accept that that has, has happened. It's sort of protecting that rather than actually debating how we are going to leave. And I'm afraid as a constituency member of parliament, I am absolutely going to stand up for the economic uh, security of my constituents, uh, the, uh, the values that we have as a country and our constitution. We have uh, in this current bill that was being debated, we had a lot of powers that were going to come back to the government, to the executive, and not to be scrutinised by Parliament. I'm afraid as a backbench member of Parliament, that is not right. Uh, and just because we have a precedent now, we say, well, this is just for Brexit, then what happens next time that Parliament is, you know, got round so that the government can carry on exercising? People in this audience and elsewhere would go, what on earth were you doing as members of Parliament, not scrutinising this deal properly at the time? Isabel Oakeshott. Well, no, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Nikki, but I think this is sanctimonious twaddle. No. <laughs> We've heard a lot from you about putting country before party. I think this is all about you, actually, because you don't believe in Brexit, do you? Ultimately, you say that you've accepted it's going to happen. 
but I don't think that you believe in it. And I think this is about well, trying to... Well, we've got to have some sort of loyalty test now. You know, loyalty... Oh, come on, OK. You've got to, you've got if to, we're going to get on to loyalty, you've got to I'm, actually look, look. embrace it, love it, and agree with it. I'm Hang really happy that you've brought us onto the question of loyalty, because I wonder how you, as a Conservative MP, felt as you trotted through the lobbies last night with Sick. Labour, Sick. With, with Actually, Labour MPs I did not who were later to, to be heard singing the red flag. How did no, you feel? Well, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I didn't hear anyone singing anything, you but have, I have to you say have I did not. You humiliated the Prime Minister, you have undermined her negotiating <laughs> position, and you are not standing up for what the people of this country voted for. Right, uh, of course, Rebecca Long Bailey was there, Labour were in the opposition lobbies. What do you want? How do you answer the question? <laughs> Well, Brexit is going to happen, whatever people's opinions might be of Brexit. Last night's vote was not an attempt to block Brexit. It was to give Parliament the right to scrutinise and vote on the final deal. What does scrutinise mean? Sorry, can I put a very hmm. simple question? What does scrutinise mean if it doesn't mean change the deal that has been negotiated? Well, we don't know whether we'll have scope to change the final deal. That will be up to Europe to decide whether we might be able to bring things back to the negotiating table. But it gives us the option, it gives us the option of scrutinising the final deal and assessing whether no deal or the deal on the table is best for the country. At the moment, at the moment, the government wanted to push through their deal without any parliamentary oversight. And the way that they've dealt with Brexit so far, quite frankly, has been shambolic. They told us... They told, us, they, told us that they, they told us that they carried out impact assessments of various sectors, yet a few months later they tell us that those impact assessments don't exist. We had Philip Hammond threatening to turn the UK into a tax haven if we didn't get the deal we wanted. So I'm not about to let the Conservatives have a blank cheque to write away our economic but destiny. I, but, uh, uh, Rebecca Long Bailey, can I just, you, you said something. I think you said this. You said we ha, we we ha, will have the power to decide whether what's on the table or no deal is better for That's Britain. Right. Brexit, is that what you mean? Brexit, Not you don't want to change the deal. Brexit will happen, whatever no, the outcome but do you of want the final vote on the deal. Do you want the power to change the deal that the Prime Minister and David Davis and the others have negotiated? Or do you just want the power to say, we don't like that at all, we'll what have Labour's policy is no what, deal? No, what last night... We don't want to have a no-deal option, but what last night's amendment gave us was the opportunity to scrutinise the deal and request that the government go back to Europe if we mm. want to amend certain parts of it. Now, that's not to say that Europe mm. will agree to that, but it's an option now that wasn't there before. All right. Let's hear from... We've got a lot of people with their hands up. Let's hear from... No, let's hear uh, from members of our audience one by one. You here on the right, madam, first. He bounced in and round like a tennis ball. It goes backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, until we'll all expire before we ever get there. Right. <laughs> Because you think it's just going to go on? This, I think it'll know. just get thrown back. All right. Why can't all of you agree to do, go down a, a, an agreed path? It doesn't sound as if this audience can agree, so I don't know how those comments would agree. The man in pink yeah, there, you, sir. David. Yes. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> I think it just showed political naivety, because all you've done is taken the negotiating arm away from the, pilot, the, the government that we sent off to negotiate. <laughs> and... If you've, ever, if you've ever been in a negotiation, to sit at a negotiating table and get told, right, are you prepared to deal? Have you got the authority to deal? They can't say that now. They've got no authority to deal. Nicky Morgan, do you want to answer him? I'm afraid I, I disagree. I mean, the EU Parliament is, is also going to have a vote, so that would also apply in that case to the EU negotiators. I don't agree that's... It's about that's our, parliament, thing... our Parliament. Our Parliament It is about our Parliament. You're absolutely right. Back, and you could yes. potentially put us into a no-deal Brexit because if it gets to the end of the clock ticking and we can't agree, where do we end up? Well, there are some people who, who want there to be a, a no-deal, and that's actually something that I think would be deeply damaging for the country. Well, and actually it's making sure... Well, what we've got is the opportunity for the UK Parliament to look at the final deal, and if we're kept, obviously, informed, uh, as we were, you know, last week, Parliament was actually very supportive of the Prime Minister's achievement in getting onto the Phase 2 talks. You're killing it's it by committee. You don't even understand. You're killing it by committee. Okay. There's that many people involved now. Well, but, we're but never course, going to get a good right, deal. Let's pause it's, there. It's, Robert Winston. David, can we just cut out the rhetoric for a second? We might be helpful. First of all, I never thought I'd say this to Nicky Morgan, but I congratulate you for your vote last night. I think it was a brilliant <laughs> 
I think you, you did exactly what was in the spirit of the whole Brexit issue. The reason why people voted for Brexit was because they wanted to have the sovereignty of the British Parliament. And what you ensured last night was the sovereignty of the British Parliament, so that Parliament, so that Parliament would have a say in how things are negotiated. And that was something which was splendid to do, and I congratulate you. I've read the whole of the Hansard very carefully, every word of that debate, and looked at who spoke, and I'm very impressed by the standard of the debate. I think it was a very, very high standard. But there are some real problems that we have to face. For example, in the NHS, there's a massive problem growing because of Brexit. There's also the issue of Euratom, which nobody's discussing. And these are things which are really important. For example, we now no longer will have any kind of relationship with Europe over, uh, over <coughs> atomic uh, uh, isotopes. So, for example, things like that means it's going to affect the whole of cancer therapy, all sorts of drug uh, uh, making, all kinds of issues which affect medical treatment on a day-to-day -day basis in our hospitals, leaving aside the manpower crisis which is growing. Um, there are also all sorts of other issues which need to be disentangled, and that's why we absolutely have to have this negotiation, and it has to be run by Parliament. It can't be run by Brussels. So, Sarah... Uh yeah, is it? Is it I, I, I come to you. For, yeah, I mean, I'll just speak as a, perhaps uh, the non-politician, non-journalist, uh, is that I, when I was on the show earlier this year, I started off by saying that I felt sorry for Theresa May, and I can't believe I'm going to say it again. I did feel sorry for her. She's had quite a year, you know, yeah. coughing up a furball at the uh, party conference, <laughs> uh, calling an election she didn't win, uh, squirming on the couch at the one show. She might have felt reasonably entitled to think that having got through a very difficult first phase of the negotiation, that she might be able to go into a Christmas and enjoy um, her mince pies. And I think that, you know, the Tory rebels... Look, I, I take you at face value, Nicky, in what you're saying in, in terms of wanting to do the right thing at the country, but I, I don't know if the net effect might still be uh, different to what you intended. And I think the Tory rebels have got to be careful because May's grip on power is tenuous at best. You might get a harder Brexiteer in charge in the end, somebody perhaps like Jeremy Corbyn, perhaps. Um, and I... <laughs> not a wise thing at saying Barnsley, but anyway... Um, <laughs> I, know, but I think the real crux of this issue always seems to come down to this. It's a single market, isn't it? Every argument comes back to a single market and freedom uh, of movement. And I think the freedom of movement thing is important. Now, I grew up in London, and my experience of immigration was an incredibly positive thing. But, you know, London isn't Britain. I think it's important to say that. London isn't Britain, and people's experience of immigration around the country is wildly different. And when you saw those MPs waving uh, their order papers last night and cheering, there's a lot of the country that wouldn't have looked on that well. And I think that there's a lot of Leave voters like me that think that, that see immigration as, as a necessary and welcome part of any uh, liberal democracy, but that perhaps it shouldn't be unlimited in perpetuity and that that decision shouldn't be taken elsewhere. That I welcome some immigration, but that decision should be taken here and not in Brussels. Okay. Yes. I mean, yeah. I really couldn't agree more with Nikki and, and Robert there. I mean, the Leave campaign all throughout the Brexit referendum, you know, shouted and yelled about sovereignty for the UK Parliament, sovereignty for the UK, and then when, you know, Nikki bravely votes for that, suddenly she's being attacked. Do you know what I mean? It well, doesn't make sense. Yeah. Okay. Isabel? Can, I, can I pick up on that? Because where exactly was Nikki when sovereignty was ceded to Brussels over decades? I didn't see Nikki manning the barricades no, in favour of sovereignty. I mean, uh, and I want to make another point, which is about trust here. And I think we've got a real issue with trust in our MPs to carry out the will of the people. If you just take Barnsley as an example, 68% of people in Barnsley voted to leave. Unfortunately, 73% of our MPs are Remainers, and that is now being played out in the Houses of Parliament in a way that erodes trust in the execution of the will of the people. And I think that is a real problem. Okay. Yes, sir, the, ma the man on the gangway there, you in blue, yes. Yes, we, we're constantly being told by these elite politicians and obviously she's done a really treacherous act last night against the Conservative yeah. Party, yeah. but the lady on the other side is in a party that should be defending the working class communities that this town is, and, and their party is tending towards the single market now, which is unrestricted migration, and that is what this town overall voted leave to stop because it damaged the working class community. She's worse than her, in effect, and her party is doing more damage 
to these communities if we're going to hear that Keir Starmer yeah. keep on about the single markets on yeah. its way back. Yeah. That's what we wouldn't have in these working class traditional communities and you're stabbing us in the back yeah. if you're going to carry on what happened last night oh, yeah. with those treacherous rebels and bring that down upon us. You'd not, and when he says about parliamentary sovereignty, the people are the sovereign to put the representatives in a parliament. Yeah. And we made our decision. We know why we made it. I know you say we're thick up north, but I remember voting on my ballot paper and it said, it said leave or remain. And it didn't say when I put my box in leave, now turn to question two, do you want the soft Brexit or do you want the hard Brexit? Rebecca. <laughs> Rebecca, Rebecca Long Bailey. Look, we're quite clear that Brexit is going to happen, but we want a deal that puts we want a deal that well, puts our like economy. We want a deal that puts Drop our economy. Drop the single first. market. Now last oh, night, yeah, let, let, last let, night's let, let, vote was shout. important because over the last few weeks it's been very rarely reported in the media as to the amendments that were put through in the EU withdrawal bill. But the Conservative voted against Labour's amendments to make sure that workers' rights were protected. They voted against Labour's amendments to make sure that our environmental rights and safeguards were protected. They haven't dealt with the Euratom issue, as Robert has discussed earlier. And they also didn't look at specific sectors, specific parts of crucial industry that reflect areas of Barnsley, areas of Salford, where I'm from, where if we did not get a good deal from the European Union, we would be on our knees economically, and that would not support you. <laughs> But, 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 just, but, but just stick with his point. He said he voted out and Labour wants a single market, I think are the words John McDonnell used. Uh, they want easy, easy immigration. You know, what is it about vote leave that you accept? We want an economic arrangement with the European Union that allows us to trade freely so that the industries That's we have here, so that the industries that we have here that. can trade in the best She's way possible. In terms of free movement, we recognise that coming out of the European Union means that free movement will end. Pierre and we Starmer want, to, and we want to use that as an opportunity to end the undercutting of pay by people exactly. that have been shipped in from but Europe. But we're hearing Keir Starmer, I heard him last Sunday, it's, he mentioned single market. Yes. He said he wanted now, similar benefits to, to that we currently okay. have within if the single market. He didn't clarify. say he wanted to stay okay. as a member of the single he market. He did say he wanted easy movement rather than free oh, movement, whatever what that means. What does that mean? What? Yeah. <laughs> okay. the, man, the, the, the man up there, uh, on the one three down on the gangway there, you, sir. The EU are never going to give us a good deal because whatever we think is a good deal is a bad deal for them. Not so all this Not bickering, when you're having a go at Theresa May's weaker shit at the moment, is just undermining our country okay, and Brian. our so-called chance to try and get a right. good deal. Brian, you want him. Robert, I mean. Well, I don't think that's true at all. A, a, a bad deal for us doesn't mean it's a good deal for Europe or vice versa. In fact, a good deal of for both of us they, would they be... They can't give, they no, can't I, give us a I'm good sorry, deal because it looks bad on them. There's a future here for the whole of... Western Europe, including Britain, to actually live in a way which is going to be mutually satisfactory. And it's very, very foolish to think in terms of what's a good deal for us is a bad deal for them or vice versa. That's not how it works. That's not how dealership works. And I have to say, it's all very well saying, uh, talking about trust, but the difficulty really, of course, is that if you have a, a very weak and undermined Prime Minister, then, of course, these debates which you have in Parliament at the moment do look rather stark, but they need to be had. They're really essential. And at the moment, I mean, to the gentleman over there who's, who's worried about f financial things in, in Yorkshire, believe me, I understand that. I have a huge love for Yorkshire. I've spent a lot of my working time in Yorkshire. But the fact of the matter is, you also want cancer treatment in Yorkshire, and there's a real risk that the machines and the drugs and the other things that we need, such as the isotopes, will not be available to us unless we actually drive a very difficult bargain. And that's a very complicated issue. Uh, Robert, Robert you're, you're in the House of Lords, and the, the, the stories are that the House of Lords are going to be much rougher on anything Theresa May comes back with or David Davis comes back with well, than was, the House of Commons. Is that I true, do you think? I was rather hoping you weren't going to raise that, because, of course, one of the issues about the vote last night does drive a chink through the debate when it comes to the House of Lords. Of course, you're going to come back to your report stage, presumably in the Commons anyway. That's, that'll be the next stage. But eventually, this will have to go through both Houses of Parliament. And I think the House of Lords may take a very 
very more collected view than actually what has happened in the Commons. Because I think a lot of the things which were represented in that debate yesterday from the people who I saw speaking so volubly and so mm. well are often reflected in many debates that we're having in the House but, of Lords. But Robert, just to cut to the chase, is this, as some people may suspect, the beginning of a movement that will lead to us not actually leaving the EU? Well, of course, this comes back to the problem with, with the referenda. I notice you don't say no. Well, well I haven't, I, I'll come to that, if I may. All right. Yeah. But, I mean, one of the problems is this shows the foolishness of having a vote, vote like a referendum, because a, a referendum with a simple yes Why is it over a complicated issue, over a complicated issue is, is very, very unsatisfactory. And we're seeing some of the results of that. It's something which the House of Lords tried to prevent very hard. The House of Lords was pretty wise. We put down innumerable am amendments but you which would have prevented it, yeah, this happening. But uh, you haven't answered my question. Do you okay. think it might not happen? It could just possibly, but I think it's very, very but unlikely. And, and if it doesn't happen, Nicky Morgan will be the first step towards that... Well, I think that's up to Nicky no, Morgan. No, I don't think so. I think, it, look, it's going to happen. We're going to leave the European Union. But what you the did question is... You've been involved in... It's the beginning of the death of Brexit by no, a thousand not. amendments. No, They're going to try not. and strangle... Uh, and I think, I think it's dangerous. I mean, no, no, but I'm there sorry. was a massive turnout. And it's not a zero-sum game. If, because what they realised, there wasn't the will in the country for a second referendum, and they're trying to do it <coughs> a different way. But there was a huge turnout for this. There was a clear majority, yes, admittedly not a huge really. majority. And I think that the democratic consequences of this... It's not a zero-sum game, is it? That people will... Be, be, I don't think it's the same as someone like Farage that thinks that there'll be civil disobedience, because I think this country's better than that. But I think that there may be disengagement, and people maybe will start looking for more radical parties. So I think you've just got to get well, tread carefully. Well, I entirely agree with you. I entirely agree with you that actually, if this were not to happen, leaving the European Union, it would, as members of Parliament and I think everyone, it would totally undermine the democracy and the vote that we have had. And that is why I have voted to trigger Article 50, I have voted to give the EU withdrawal bill a second reading, I've voted to repeal the European Communities Act 1972. But yes, I would like Parliament to be involved in the process going forward. And gentlemen up here talked about representatives. That's exactly what we have. That's we have a representative democracy. And you're also right to say that on that ballot paper were only two options, leave or remain. It did not say how we were going to leave, nor the deal that we are going to get. Right. The, the woman in the second row from the back there. Um, people on the panel have talked about trust, and other people in the audience have said that the vote last night takes away the power from the people negotiating. But I don't trust David Davies and Theresa May to negotiate a deal for me. And I, I didn't vote for them. I voted for my MP in Parliament. And my MP in Parliament should be part of scrutinising whatever deal we should get. OK. And you, sir. Yeah. This is irrelevant anyway. It doesn't matter that 11 Conservative MPs revolted last night. It doesn't matter what the Labour or Conservatives think. The, the decision for Brexit is going to come down to the DUP. You can't even keep a devolved government in Ireland together. <laughs> and that's the problem. And the man there in blue. Let's hear some more members of our audience. There are a lot of hands up. In the third row from the back, you. Um, because of the way MPs voted last night, yes. they have massively increased our chances of getting no deal because the amount of time it takes for an Act of Parliament to be passed and for there to be approval from MPs is, is it takes a while and we're unlikely to get a deal until late in March 2019, you know, looking at it positively. And so then you've got to look and they, then you've got to pass an Act of Parliament. And so there's a massive chance that we're going to get to the 29th of March uh, 2019 and we're not going to have a deal. And we're just going to go off a cliff edge, and that's mainly because of what the way MPs voted and, and last do, night. Do you think? Do you think it would be off a cliff edge, or do you think it would just be an extended year or two of negotiation? Well, the, they talked about transition, transition deal, but more. that none of that's been confirmed yet. So as it stands, yeah. you know, if, if MPs are going to vote like that, then we're just going to go off a cliff edge. All right, it's an important point. It, it is an important point, and actually, there, there are three things I want to say in response to that. Firstly, the government had already conceded. Uh, several weeks ago that we were going to have an Act of Parliament which would approve the withdrawal agreement. Secondly, Acts of Parliament can be got through both houses very, very speedily. Third, the European Parliament is expecting their voting process to start next autumn, October 2018. Now, I think that's obviously, uh, it's a big challenge to negotiate uh, everything and to have the detail, but that's what everyone's aiming for. But the fourth thing, actually, uh, is that you have just proven why the amendment that is down for having a hard day to the 29th of March 2019, 11pm, is not a good idea. It's because things can just take a little bit longer. We saw that, actually, with the way Theresa May worked when she had the knockback at the start of last week. She worked and worked and worked. <coughs> she moved away from the negotiating deadline the EU had set. She got to where we were last Friday and she got that deal together. 
get us on to phase two. It doesn't two, help that, that you're welcomed. trying to delay the process. No, no, I'm not trying to delay the process. Mm -hmm. All we are saying is exactly as the audience have said, which is actually the campaign was about taking back control. Control is going to come back to a sovereign parliament where representatives are elected by members of parliament. You, you, sir, you sir, in spectacles, sir. I voted to leave. But one of, one of the things is I did realise that it's going to be it's a complicated situation. It's not going to happen overnight. And some people think it's going you vote yes, we're going to leave away we go. It doesn't work like that. There's too much to sort out. Yeah. There's too much to agree, and there's too much importance on our uh, poverty. We've got enough as it is now. We don't want to have any more. And if we can sort it out, we've got a better deal. We've got better trade. Then so be it. And what's your view? Uh, what's your view about the role Parliament should play, as Nicky Morgan has expressed? I think they should vote on the final. That's why we elect people. And if we don't like what they say, we we'll de deselect them. Right. It's easy. Uh, the man up there on the on the gangway there in pink, yes, or yeah, white. Um, yeah. The difficulty is, is we we set off on the wrong foot. For me, this was a. This was an issue of national importance, and I believe at that point we should have had a, a cross-party committee, so all sides represented. <laughs> the difficulty is we've got one party representatives in Europe, and I, and I think that's just quite narrow-minded. Um, and I know well, I elected my MP, and I voted to, to leave purely on those grounds that we would have the capacity to go out there and negotiate with cross-party uh, representation. So I think. You know, up to a point, I agree with you, Nikki. I, I do actually believe you're not representing your constituency properly because they are obviously a, a, a leave constituency. So, um, but it's debatable. Um, yeah, I think you were right last night. I think we do need to debate it. As for scrutiny, I think the media will do its role. I think Brexit will be scrutinised more than anything else. Okay. And the man on the other side of the gangway, and then I'll come back to you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do believe that the Tories didn't have any game plan. Uh, initially, the first round talks, can they tell us what they actually got out of the first round talks? It's all what EU giveaways. The EU led us off with 35 million. They, uh, initially, they wanted about 80, 80 million or so. Figures were being banded around, or 80 billion, sorry. So what is it that David Davis achieved in the first round of talks? Can they tell us that? So I applaud you. For sticking out and making sure that we review whatever they bring back. Okay, Isabel um, Well, I think um, this is a really good point, and no one should feel that just because we originally thought we might have to pay 70 or 80 billion, 35 is actually fantastic. It's still an awful lot of money. But, you know, we have to be pragmatic about these things. I just want to pick up on what Lord Winston was saying, because I thought it was really interesting that he wasn't actually denying the possibility that Brexit might not happen. And there are other um, Labour peers for whom I have a great respect, for example, Lord Adonis, who said today that last night's result was the first step towards stopping Brexit. We should not make any mistake about how powerful the vested interests are in making sure that we stay in the EU. And they will stop at nothing, make no mistake. Isabel, forgive me. I, 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 I love Andrew Erdogan, he's a lovely man, but I completely disagree with him. I was asked a straight question whether this would make any difference, and of course it's absolutely impossible to predict the future, and clearly there is a momentum, to use perhaps the wrong word, um, <laughs> there is a momentum With a small M rather with than a small M, big M, yes. which, which just might in fact um, leave a chink for that possibility. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is an issue, but it's inevitable when you have a parliamentary discussion that things change. That's all I'm saying. I'm not okay. saying that I'm supporting uh, not having Brexit, and I'm certainly not supporting Andrew Adonis. Uh, Andrew <laughs> Adonis is his own man. All right, I'll take a couple more points, we must move on in a moment. Uh, from you, and then I'll come to you in the front row there, yes. Nikki points out that it's not to stop, but within minutes of um, voting, Anna Soubry and others were tweeting out, now we can stop in the single market, customs union. And then 45 minutes later, the EU chief negotiator, Guy Forge, that tweeted it out, so if he thinks it's a good idea, it suggests it's an establishment stitch-up. Right. Um, do you agree with that? Yeah. No? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
No, I'm, uh, I've got dual nationality. I'm both a, a British citizen and a European national. And I'd like to know if this is an opportunity to rethink and reboot Europe and what place in Europe will Britain have. You can't deny the history you've had for thousands of years. So what happens next? And what do you think should happen? <laughs> I'm not the politician. <laughs> You're glad you have dual nationality? I am, yes. Yes. OK, uh, just before we go, Rebecca Lombelli, you haven't spoken for a bit. What do you say to this <laughs> idea that behind all this is a challenge from an establishment, whatever that might be, to see off the idea of Brexit and to find a way of procrastinating so that in the end we don't actually quite leave? No, I think the vast majority of MPs in Parliament respect the referendum as I do. We want to make sure that Brexit is delivered and we want an economy first Brexit. Now, what's interesting about last night was that it was an embarrassment for the Prime Minister. It showed that she couldn't hold her government together. But it puts pressure on her now to work on a cross-party basis and make sure that people's concerns are actually listened to and that she can put forward a final deal that satisfies as many people as possible and delivers the best deal possible because nobody wants to vote against a deal and nobody that I've spoken to, there might be a small minority that want no deal as an option, no, Rebecca, but the vast Rebecca, majority don't want no deal. Your, your party embarrasses itself every single day on Brexit. I am completely confused. I'm completely confused about your party's position. It changes with the wind. Do you want to leave the single market? Well, we recognise that when we leave the European Union, we come out of the single market. I think. Do that's you want quite free clear. movement or do you want easy movement? Or on what free is it movement. Today? On free movement. I already made the point. You should have been paying attention. I, I actually heard it you, earlier. but it made no more sense to me. No we stated, stated that we recognise that free movement would end. We realise that there have been abuses, there have been undercutting of wages through the use of agency staff that have been brought over <laughs> to the UK, and that is not acceptable. And we need to have a system of reasonable and fair managed migration. You can't possibly say that the Tory position is shambolic, though, because yours is but at it least is shambolic. All right, All right. We, must, we must go. But you, the man in the centre here, you want to pick up on what they were saying? Uh, yeah. Uh, hold on, no, the, the, the man here. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. It's obviously it's going to go through Parliament, but obviously, listening to Lord Winton, uh, you're going to have problems in House of Lords with all these amendments, so it's going to go on and on from one Parliament to the next, and I can tell that the man clearly states there's going to be problems with the Lords before anything... Sorry, what's the shout? Abolish the Lords or abolish Parliament? No, we're not saying abolish the Lords, but the divisions... Divisions Sorry. are actually at the table. OK. Before we start... <laughs> what? Abol well, was that abolish Parliament or abolish the House of Lords? I wasn't quite sure. Yes, you. Yeah, okay, let's just stick with a moment longer. You say yes. Yes, uh, I think that uh, all the politicians, right on the day after the, uh, the referendum, never ever expected the result that they got. Yeah. And that's why. That's why I think every one of them from all parties looked in the mirror that following morning and said, Right, guys, gals, what's in it for me? How can I get to the people? So there is total confusion reigned, in other words. I'll take one yes. more point from up there, the very top on the right. Yes, you, sir. Hey, thank you. Um, I do believe that um, following the referendum, and especially coming from Barnsley myself, um, that there, there seems to be an irrational fear that the, the United Kingdom is incapable of standing on its own in the world. Um, it's, it's definitely uh, resonant in offices throughout the UK, on the street, in the pub, by having a beer, smoke, whatever you're doing. People don't want, I personally believe, that people don't want to argue that all right, well, we'll, we'll go with these extreme left policies, we'll go with these extreme right policies, and, End of the day, we're leaving the European Union. I, well, I, I believe we are, based on the, the vote that, I, that we took. The vote that you year. took, you may, the yeah, vote that you put. Did you, well, vote, you vote Brexit, did you? Um, oh, you don't have to say. I'm, yes. going to, I, I'm going to admit that, yes, I did vote for Brexit, hey. yeah. But um, I'm not going to say that I did it reluctantly. Um, I have been a vehement left-winger the majority of my life, especially coming from Barnsley and being an ethnic minority. Um, I just think that, God, as, as, we, as we progress, I do believe that, the, the, um, that, that there, re, there really is an irrational fear that the United Kingdom 
cannot cannot survive without some sort of attachment or allegiance to the European Union. Please just listen to the will of pe will of the people and leave the European Union. Okay. Right. Well, I think we better move on because we're halfway through the programme with that, for those very pertinent, lively comments. But um, just before we go on to another question, I should say where we're going to be. We're, we're not on next week. Uh, we're, we're off for Christmas. We're back in January. We're going to be in Islington in London and the week after that in Hereford. And on the screen are the details of how to apply. Um, let's, let's have a complete change of subject. Um, and have a question from Linda Wilson, please. Linda Wilson. Yeah, um, should the government fund voucher payments of up to £200 to encourage women to breastfeed their babies? I didn't hear the question. Oh, good Lord. Should... They're all looking surprised. I couldn't hear the question. Oh, I'll Sorry. tell you the question. Should the government fund voucher payments of £200 to encourage mothers to breastfeed their babies? It's rather up your street. Well. And this... <laughs> and, the, and this... And well, this... And this, has been, this was a policy that's been experimented with here, come from Sheffield University. Yes, I know. Yeah? And, um, I'm aware uh, of the data. And the, uh, you, you know, right. And the idea is that you pay mothers uh, to breastfeed and this leads to a healthier child. We've got, I think, three mothers around the table and many mothers here, no well, doubt. I, what, what, but let's go to you. You're the, I, I, the child all, expert. First of all, I think it's a policy that wouldn't work. But more, more importantly, what we need to do is to persuade people why it's good to breastfeed and to point out that the value to the baby is really very considerable in all sorts of ways, not only in its nutrition, but also in its defence against infection and indeed in its bonding with, with its mother. Now, paying people does not improve the bonding for a start. And so there's a disconnect here with this thinking. And I think it's very clear that one of the problems with this campaign and the real difficulty is that because the NHS is increasingly strapped with staff which are desperately needed, the midwives and the nursing staff who would normally help women who are inconfident of breastfeeding are not always there. And it has been shown again and again that if you have proper support for mothers who are breastfeeding or who are prepared to try breastfeeding, it makes a massive difference to how long they'll breastfeed for. What happens at the present time, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, is a large number of women get very frightened or feel very vulnerable, think that they're not feeding their baby properly and the baby's going to starve, and so they give up breastfeeding and they take the bottle. And that's not ideal. Paying is not the answer. What is needed, of course, is much better medical uh, And was care. it a success, this campaign? They say there was a slight increase in the number of women well, in this area. May, maybe, but, you know, the trouble is, unless you have a good comparator with a properly, properly controlled trial, the stats, this, you know. these figures are very suspect. The, the woman at the back there, and then we'll go around our panel here. Yes, um, at the very back. I, I think it's a, a misnomer to say that it's down to funding now, because I had my children 20 years ago, and the support then for breastfeeding was very poor. Uh, there was very little support indeed, and I think one of the big problems is that women don't feel comfortable feeding in public, because... It's ridiculous, but there's still a problem with breastfeeding in public, including, I believe, in the House of Commons. I believe it's that women aren't allowed to feed babies in the House of Commons. That, I may be wrong, but if that's the case, that's, that's ridiculous. Not true. I, I think one, one, uh, I think the, that taboo was broken, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, so Helene Hayman was the, was was the first. Yeah. I don't know about the chamber, I have to say, um, because I haven't actually seen anybody doing it in no, my it seven years that I've uh, been there, but in, in the, obviously in the, the building and everything else. Yeah. But I think it probably has been done, and I, I think, but, but, uh, I'd hope it wouldn't be a problem if it were to be but, done. But the, point, but the point is right. The, yes, this this, this issue of, of sensitivity about showing breasts in public and so on, and it's something, it's a cultural issue, uh, unfortunately, and this, is, this, and, and this is a very, I think, a very negative um, comment on our society. Breastfeeding <laughs> is good, it's healthy, and it should be permitted in public, and we have to encourage it. Well, um, Isabel Oakshot. I'd like to give a, a slightly different point of view on this. I think it's time that we ended the breastfeeding tyranny. I have three children. I'm one of a very small minority. I think it's about 2% of women who actually physically did not produce milk. And I had gone to my NCT classes, I was desperate to breastfeed, I'd, you know, had all the information, I know it's nutritionally the best, 
I wish I could have done it. I couldn't do it and I felt absolutely awful about it. It was heartbreaking and really difficult. And you know what? Once I introduced bottle feeding and powdered milk, my baby thrived, my other children have thrived. There is nothing wrong with powdered milk. It is liberating for women. They should not be made to feel failures if they cannot breastfeed. Thank you. Thank you. believe that um, I'm going to say this but I should agree with you now I'm um, a mum um, and I did feed uh, my children myself until they were at least a year old I found every single day every single feed hard work it was hellish mm. however there's a point I'd like to make here and I speak with some experience on this how many of the panel understand that there is artificial price fixing of infant formula milk there is legislation that exists today that means that the brand, the supermarkets, cannot sell below cost. That has led to artificial price fixing between the producers and the manufacturers. It is no surprise that there is no own label brand on the market for those reasons, because they are also held to ransom by certain individuals and certain campaigners um, that really do undermine a woman's choice as to okay. whether or not to Let breastfeed or not. Re Re Rebecca long do you know that was... That's a very, shadow business a very interesting concept, and I, I'm hesitant to say that I agree slightly with all of the comments that have been made by the panellists so far. I think that in terms of the support available to women, certainly when I was a mother five years ago, I've got a five-year-old little boy, I found that there was very little support in terms of breastfeeding advice. When I did find that advice, I found that it was heavily weighted in all or nothing. You had to breastfeed, breastfeed, breastfeed. There was no encouragement to mix things up and my husband wanted to be quite a hands-on parent and he wanted to share the burden of feeding my son and I felt bad for, for, for mixing it up we tried it ourselves it worked it's not done him any harm he's a strapping lad so far <laughs> but uh, but the other issue I think and, and Robert's touched on this is that there is a funding crisis in the NHS this information should be readily available through public health outlets, but public health has seen the greatest cuts than it's seen in a generation. We've got the vast majority of our hospital trusts on the edge of a cliff. I think it's 61% of acute hospitals are in deficit at the moment. We've had cuts to the likes of which we've never seen before to our NHS budgets. 6.3 billion from social care, 600 million from mental health. And the NHS was also asked... Please. Was also, I'm coming... To, it was also asked to make £22 billion people, pounds sorry, in efficiency savings. So when we, we were talking before, the, the, the audience said to me, as chair, yeah. can't you get them to answer the question we asked? No, <laughs> and, 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 and not... And, 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 not just, and not just talk about anything no, the they point, want to talk the point about. That I'm the question to make, was about milk. No, the point that I'm trying to make is that we're talking, we're talking about um, NHS vouchers for breastfeeding, but we should pounds already have the support there through our public health. All right, we fine. don't due to NHS funding. The woman at the very back there, please. The question's about breastfeeding. It's not about money. Why do we have to incentivise everything? Yeah. Stop making it about money. It's about the yeah. culture of being able to breastfeed and not shaming okay. anybody okay. should they not be able yeah. to. I, I, couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more. And I also think that the idea that there's not pressure on new mothers to breastfeed is ridiculous. I mean, midwives do a fantastic job, but there is a, the way that they keep saying, oh, it's, it's your choice. It's your choice. It's up to you. It sort of ends up sounding like some sort of mafia thing. Where no, no, it's absolutely. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, we won't judge you. They keep saying we won't judge you, and it, you know, put to put a lot of pressure on my wife, and I was sympathetic to that. I also think it's just a bizarre idea. Two hundred pounds. Where's the verification for this? Do you do it price per litre? I have no idea. Do you, <laughs> do you interrogate the child? I'm, it's just. And, and, and I really, I, I couldn't agree more with the lady. It's about where is personal responsibility? I think that there are so many pressures on the NHS. We often talk about funding. We often talk about the service itself. But we don't talk about the undue demands that people are increasingly making on the NHS through avoidable illnesses, through missing doctor's appointments. Now you're going and off I think, track. But well, I'll end by saying that I think that, you know, uh, the NHS, if we want it to care for us, we, we've got to do more to care for it. And that involves taking personal responsibility for your own health. OK. Right. We'll go on. I'd like to take a question now from Kian Cross, please. Kian Cross. 
What should be done to tackle the rise in homelessness? What should be done? A very straightforward question to tackle the rise in homelessness. I was going to ask you to start on that, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I've voted Conservative for a while now, but that, like, like all of us here, it's not a blanket endorsement of everything that they do. And I gig a lot and I tour in towns, big cities, uh, all across the UK, and, and it's palpable over the last two years, the rise in homelessness, and it's no coincidence that in a period where I think funding has halved, homelessness has doubled. You know, and I know that the government uh, has heads turn, uh, are turned at the moment on Brexit and it's a very difficult time around that. But it's also a very cold time of year and it's also coming up for Christmas. And I think that it would be good if the government could find a bit of time just to give the magic money tree a little shake uh, and perhaps uh, di divert some emergency funds towards homelessness, really. Do you think... No. <laughs> Nicky Morgan, emergency funds, would that do it? Well, actually, the budget, uh, I was just looking at the uh, numbers. Um, uh, Philip Hammond announced in November £28 million for uh, three Housing First uh, pilots in Manchester, Liverpool and the West Midlands. And these pilots have been very successful uh, about helping, because obviously there's lots of complex reasons for uh, homelessness uh, and also supporting people to tackle off some of the underlying uh, issues. I know as a constituency member of parliament, people will come to you for help with one issue, but actually there's, there's a lot else going on. When you say complex reasons for homelessness, isn't not having a home the reason for um, homelessness? Debt, mental health, addictions, family and breakdown. And houses? Of well, of course. Alcohol. How, how long, sorry, how long are the waiting lists in this country for housing? Uh, I'm afraid I don't have the I don't have a number, uh, but uh, obviously too long, too long. But there are also uh, just to give a constituency example. So we have a, a gentleman who um, uh, we have helped several times now to get a, a flat, but actually because of other issues in his life, he is not able to to, to keep it. And his neighbours, there are issues and, and all the rest of it. It's very frustrating. He has a fabulous officer who is trying to help him, and every time we think we have hopefully got him to the stage where he's taking that responsibility, being somewhere, then something unfortunately happens mm. and we have to kind of start but, again. But, but, those you're are, talking those about, but you're talking so, about, I mean, the, the figures show 80,000 householders in temporary accommodation, I yes, think that's right. It's, it's, 4,000 rough course, sleepers it's, or it's, more. It's, I mean, it's one person who, is, who has, a, obviously, I don't want to go into the detail, a particular problem, doesn't answer the overall question about homelessness, no, does no, it? Absolutely, and of course, it, it's too much. We need to build more housing, we know that. We need to build more social uh, housing, uh, and, uh, but also about dealing with those needs. The Housing First pilots, we've committed to the Homelessness oh, Reduction Act. Go on, then. Well, uh, you, you, please you, uh, just get on yes. with it. It's not just one man, it's thousands well, and thousands of, of people. Of course Children. 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 Behind, but as you all know, I don't and know we've what heard you... it all, we've heard it time and time. Just do it. Get the money well, and the do it. Well, the Homelessness Reduction Act. Sort it. Sort it. Okay. Now. Uh, I'll, come, I'll come back to you. Um, Robert Winston. Well, I think one of, one of the issues, Nikki, is that people who are living in this part of Yorkshire see something very real. You know, I've been Chancellor of Sheffield Hallam University, my privilege, for the last 15 or so years. And Sheffield was not in a great state when I first took that chance. It's become a much more prosperous, self-confident city with better public services and better buildings and so on. But one thing that has been really shocking, and I noticed it particularly this last two weeks, I spent two weeks living in Sheffield, were the number of people who are living on the street in appalling weather. And this is something which I haven't seen in South Yorkshire to this extent before. And I think we have to accept that this question is a very, very relevant question to many parts of Britain. It's certainly true in London. I'm afraid it's very true in this part of the world. And it's an urgent issue. Yeah. And I agree completely. There are a lot of people with strange problems. Addition is obviously one of them. Uh, one obviously clearly is mental ill health. But there are a lot of people who just simply don't have a roof over their heads. And we need to do much yeah. more about right. it. Isabel. Is lady in the front said just get on with it just do it I mean actually I'm gonna agree with Nikki here it's actually you know she gave an example of how you can't just do it you can't in some cases snap your fingers you money and provide well, <laughs> they have tried very hard Sorry, what, what in this case you, we find money for all sorts like that. yeah but it isn't there just is a case of money one at a time you say they you hang on wait a second you say that they find money for all sorts of things yes is that yes. your point? And they yes. could find more money? All but right, it, but it isn't just a case of money. And I think we have to be quite careful about the way the statistics are used here. There has been a rise in homelessness. And, Massive, it, is, and it is deplorable. Okay? And particularly at this time of year, it is horrible 
to see people rough sleeping in this freezing weather coming up before Christmas. However, the statistics don't always tell the full story. There is a difference between homelessness, I've seen it. which is I've being. Seen it. It's not Could you just let me finish, please? There is a difference between homelessness and rough sleeping. So, homelessness is temporary accommodation, bed and breakfast. That isn't great. I'm not saying it is. But this is a complex issue. And I think mental health is a really big issue with it. And more funding for that, which actually this government is doing. Okay. The, the man up there on the right, there, you see. Um, I'm obviously one of the most evil people on earth because I'm a private landlord. Um, uh, you, the way to solve this homeless problem is get rid of the three percent landlord stamp duty because that stops me buying houses. I don't. I normally buy one or two houses a year. The, I'll, I'll buy every council house and I'll do them up because they're in a horrible state. Sorry, state. They're in a horrible state. All right. Let, let, so him, let, let him speak. Listen to what he's. OK, so does, listen, does the council madam, don't want to spend... Hang on, hang on. The I, woman I, there in the centre, let him speak, and then I'll come to you if you want to uh, argue with him. OK, be the, quick, the if you would, and then, I'll, in, and then we'll go to the lady there in the centre who shouted out. The government yes. has brought in selective licensing in bits of where I own properties, and they're now making people upgrade houses beyond the point of what they would have to be if they were a new-build house. I even had their local housing person telling me that they were ridiculous and quoted me it, the, the, the list of things he wanted me to do to a house, it was £3,000. I want to buy houses that first-time buyers don't want to buy, and I will do them up, and there's plenty of people like me, and that we can have people in homes. But you won't do it because your tax is out of existence, All right. and you, you put stamp duty right. on it. Let's go to the person who was complaining about in the centre there. Yes. We're allowing people such as yourself to buy social housing, so we've got people <laughs> ending up on the street. We've got people like you making profit, making profit at the expense of putting other people out on the Sorry, street. Sorry, but my profit goes into this government's taxes, which then you pop people and include me spend. We have people on the street so that you can make that profit. Why is it? Social I... housing has been put and put, and this government will not invest in social housing. We have got How people who are out fault? on the street. How is that? Do you know this year, right? At this moment in time, we have 120,000 children who are homeless. That is a rise of 65% in right. the last six years. Take the stamp duty that off then and take happening. the tax and make it fair and I'll buy them and I'll put people in them. All right. <laughs> Rebecca Long Bailey. You've heard the two sides of the argument well, there. Well, the lady in, in the audience has just made an important point. This Christmas, 121,000 children <laughs> won't have a home. Now, that's absolutely disgraceful. We know that rough sleeping has doubled since 2010, and at the same time, we've got the lowest level of house building since the 1920s. Now, that is an absolutely disgraceful record from this government. We need to build more affordable homes. We need we to build doing. more social homes. We need to make sure that if there are right to buy exercise, that there's a one-in-one-out policy for local authorities. Every social house sold, a new one is built to replace it. We need a charter for renters' rights to make sure that they're not ripped off by unscrupulous landlords. I'm sure the gentleman in the audience is a good landlord, but there are some out there who aren't so good, shall we say. And we need to make sure that the quality of housing is fit for purpose, because as a constituency MP, I have families coming in and telling me that they have three and four generations sleeping in one room with black mould on the walls because they can't afford to find anywhere and they can't find social housing because the waiting list is but in the tens think, of thousands. Right. the pressure on the housing is immigration and the population oh, rise. No, sorry, Isabel, just say it again because you, you, no, wait a minute, you were both talking stop. at the same time and the audience was this. Just, Isabel. Just make the point you were making. Yeah, I want to make the point that there is a correlation between the pressure on housing, which you're talking about, and population rise and the unfettered immigration that you want to continue. No, I, mean, I don't accept that. I don't, I don't right. accept well, the, that. The man in the third row there. You. Um, you're, you're talk, we're all talking about like investing in housing and that, but why aren't we doing anything now, such as build, like, building emergency shelters for these people to go in on cold nights like this? OK. And, and the woman there. I will come to you, yes. Yes, you? Things are spiralling out of control. Millions of people are now going to food banks. F genuine families are struggling. Mm -hmm. I, for one of them, have struggled. And I've had to go to a food bank with my three children. This government needs to be held account for that. These are the, these are the future of our... The, the children are our future. Are you prepared to let them starve? 
Because if it wasn't for donations from generous people, who else would feed us? Mm -hmm. It's handouts. Mm -hmm. That's how it's getting. And do you know what? Mm -hmm. I hold on. To, I no, hold on. Let Nicky Morgan reply to that because it was about the government. Well, we've got more people uh, obviously in, in work. We've got uh, income inequality has fallen. Uh, food I'm bank. not going to say. Have you ever been to a food yes, bank? Yes, of course I have. Have you? What to get food? No, I've been. It's humiliating. I, I understand. I look, I deal with the constituents who. <laughs> I've worked go all my life, life, and suddenly yeah. I became ill. There was only me to look after well, my three children. So one of the things that we're doing, I'm chairman of the House of Commons Treasury Select Committee, so one of the inquiries <coughs> that we're doing is looking at household finances, because we talk a lot as politicians about the nation's finances and big numbers, but I'm very keen to understand what's going on in households. And actually, you're right, there are millions, thousands of households who have it's less than £100 pounds in savings. Back. You've cut So back. actually, in terms of having the buffer, that actually helps people to get over, and you're right, most of us are only a couple of paychecks away from real... You care about making money for yourself. No, that's not, that's, that that's not true. That is true. That is why. You can actually get money just right. like that. Billions of pounds yeah, no, 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 no. from nowhere. No, the, the, the government, I, I've, I've already set out that in the budget this year, the Chancellor announced real uh, programmes and money and investment in relation to homelessness, uh, but there are other schemes as well, obviously things like the uh, income tax uh, thresholds, cutting food. It's just small talk, But there's also talk, the cost of... It. Small we've talk, had the no longest action. period. We've had the longest period of wage stagnation for 150 years. We've now got inflation running at 3%. Right. OK, let's uh, I take the woman behind you. You've spoken already, but I'll come back to you in a um, moment. Yes. Per perhaps no, no. we should scrap yeah. the universal credits that actually leave people in poverty in the first place. Yeah. Okay. And the woman behind you? I think that regardless of anyone's views in here on HS2, regardless of anyone's views on Brexit, regardless of anyone's views on the government, we're throwing so much money at so many different things, the coalition with the DUP, mm. HS2, Brexit. Surely our number one priority as human beings should be to protect mm, other human beings and people's <laughs> families. Jeff, what do, you, what do you say to that? We're well, there's spewing one... money out on things we shouldn't be spending it on. Well, I think, you know, some of it comes down to the actual kind of practicalities of it. I understand that um, there's a policy... Oh, give us a sec, mate. <laughs> uh, is that the, uh, the, it has to be uh, more than zero degrees centigrade for three days before the government open up extra housing. Is that accurate? I think there is a, there is a, a scheme around... Why yeah. does it have to be that cold? I mean, that is extremely cold. And with the winds that we've had recently, that seems like one thing that could be done overnight to ease the pressure. They're all actually cold weather, cold weather payments. All right, the, the woman here, you've spoken earlier on, but let's hear from you again. I suggest that the government speak to the Salvation Army because for £19 a night they'll house someone overnight. So why not on a short term? As a short I'm, sure that, I'm sure that's one of the, the organisations that we work with. And of course, a lot is down to local authorities who have the responsibility, and they will work with uh, many different local organisations. They advertise the Salvation Army request. Donations for £19 a okay. night we're, to have someone. We're nearly through. A point from you, sir, up there. If you would, quickly. Uh, yeah, I think th this, this talk of why you won't build houses is quite obvious. You're running a fake economy. The, the, the way in which uh, landlords are able to charge the prices that they charge is because we're in such phenomenal debt. It, it, it's the only reason you can... That you won't build houses because we are in a housing bubble. The minute you build houses, that bursts and the rent goes down. And instead of it being 88% debt of our GDP, it's 800% of our GDP. OK, I think we're nearly there. The woman there in the spectacles, and then we must stop. <clears throat> A massive part of homelessness is domestic violence victims. We talk that Tories implemented austerity, but let's look at our own Labour councils that are implementing that, that austerity, despite the fact that their leadership is anti-austerity. People voted for Jeremy Corbyn for a real alternative. There is one women's aid in the whole of South Yorkshire that just lost its funding because a Labour council cut that. People voted against austerity for a change. Let's see our Labour councils actually put up a real opposition and not implement cuts because it's too dangerous for people. We're seeing too many okay. people on Thank you. Well, uh, there, are, there are a lot more questions and a lot of things we could discuss uh, left undiscussed, but our time's up. We're going to be back in January with question time. We're going to be in Islington in London, uh, on the panel, among others, the lawyer and campaigner Gina Miller, uh, the comedian Nish Kumar, and Piers Morgan, the broadcaster and commentator. <laughs> <laughs> We always get that reaction when I say his name. I don't know why. And the following week, we're going to be in Hereford. So 0330 is the number to call if you'd like to come to either programme or go to the website that's on the screen there 
and follow the instructions. Question time, extra time follows, of course, on BBC Five Live. My thanks to our panel, to all of you who came here to Barnsley tonight. Uh, until next year, from Question Time, a very happy Christmas and good night. Good night. I've been